Uh, guests in this segment from the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center, Katie Spriggs, the executive director. Katie, good morning. Good morning. I'm one of the people with the power outage. Oh, yeah. I live in Morgan County. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we have no power. You made a wise decision to not try to trek in on Route 9. Route 9 has been an adventure all morning long, as have been many of the side roads, Katie. I can't. I live on the like 70 side, Maryland side of Morgan County, so I definitely would have taken 70, but I heard that was a mess this morning, too. So, yes, I think all in all, it was a good decision. I can attest, as I drove in at 4 a.m., that there was uh, it was an adventure all the way, so. Smart move to stay home. Uh, Also on the line is Brittany Bush. Brittany, good morning to you. Good morning. Where are you uh, this morning as we speak with you? I am also at my house. I'm in Jefferson County, so it's uh, not quite as bad here as it is in some of the surrounding counties, thankfully. We still have power. Good. Uh, We've got Berkeley, Jefferson, and Morgan all represented in this conversation. We've got the panhandle covered. Power is very important. you got to have power. Yeah, you got to have power. Oh, she's starting. Yeah, we're on like in a little over an hour, and it is starting to get cold in the house, so that's great. Do you have, do you have a wait. fireplace, Katie? No, oh. no. Of all days to not, right? Yeah. You might want to go out and pick up a fireplace this morning. <laughs> <laughs> no, she can't get anywhere. No power. Can't, can't yeah. get the garage door open. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Katie, the uh, legislative session is underway in uh, West Virginia, more than halfway through now, I guess. Are you watching any specific legislation out of Charleston in this session? Boy, are we. Yeah, we have a couple of legislative uh, needs this year. Um, we're still on the uh, marital exception. that we're, That's continued for, I think this is year four, that we've been discussing that one. So that's the one that would um, remove the marital exception in sexual abuse cases. So right now, in sexual abuse, uh, you can legally sexually abuse your spouse in West Virginia. Not, not rape, not completed penetrated rape, but fondling, groping, lesser uh, types of sexual abuse um, is currently legal. So we're trying to get that marital exception out. Uh, we have a sextortion bill that's moving. It moved out of the Senate on the first day. So that one's moving pretty quick. Um, thanks, President Blair, for always, he always prioritizes that bill, which we appreciate. Um, and then there is a bill to remove the domestic violence fatality review team um and we're we're advocating to keep that team the big and that actually feeds directly into what we're talking about today so it's a perfect segue but um yeah uh i guess it's the bill would also move could also move that review team under the health department which is fine by us it would move it out of the me's office uh which is fine we don't care really where it lives we just don't want it to go away because it helps us to review cases Um, that either were fatalities involving domestic violence or could have been, like we're unsure what the cause was, um, and also ones that were close fatalities. So those are um, important, obviously, considering what we're talking about today. And so we would love to keep that um, team as a review team. Katie, you said the ME's office, that's medical examiner? Yes. Sorry, yes. Okay. Uh, And uh, in, in regards to these bills, is the momentum on your side right now, or are you fighting a battle in some cases? Uh, the momentum is on our side for sextortion. Um, the sexual contact bill, I think it depends on the day, which we all know how, the, how that goes. Um, but we do have uh, Senator Trump's um, support on that bill, which is really impactful. He has a strong voice in the Senate. So hopefully we see some movement. It was in Senate Judiciary yesterday and then got pulled for some wording stuff. So hopefully we see it come back soon. And Brittany, what's your role in this? Uh, as far as the legislative things, I don't play much role in that. I'm the community coordinator for the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center, so I do a lot of the community outreach that you would see us doing in Jefferson, Berkeley, and Morgan. But I don't have much in the legislative session. So you let uh, Katie fight those battles herself is what you're saying? I think she's a little more well-equipped. She's been <laughs> at this uh, a, a lot longer than I have. Katie, how long have you been doing this? Well, uh, legislative stuff or epic in general? Epic in general. 12 years. I was going to say, I, I think I remember you were doing this shortly after I started doing this show myself. Yep, and legislative stuff, probably like 10 of those years. We've been to the Capitol once. Sexual Violence Awareness Day was February 1st, and then Domestic Violence Awareness Day is February 27th. So we'll be there again at the end of the month. What have been part, which is nice. What have been some of your legislative victories since you've been in office? Uh, getting strangulation to be a felony, that was 2015. That was really important 
Um, we clarified the definition of stalking. I think you and I talked about that one, Rob, at, at length at times. Mm -hmm. uh, we provided a, a serious, significant update to the Human Trafficking Code, which is just revolutionary because it was really bad before. Um, and we passed the Sexual Assault Survivor Bill of Rights a couple of years ago, and I would consider those definite wins. And then, of course, funding. Like, you know, where uh, the sexual assault line item increased from 500000 to $2 million, uh, just a couple of years ago, and that's been significantly impactful, not only for direct services to survivors, but also for prevention. So um, I would say those all rank pretty high on the achievement list. I remember, and they all did not come without their struggles, but sure. we made it. <laughs> and I, I know you did a lot of work on some of the bills that got passed in regards to human trafficking, and I know there's more work to do on that, mm -hmm. but because of IED1, uh, this is a major area for that, and as a result of that, at Epic, you see a lot of that in person. Yeah, we actually pulled the numbers uh, really quickly from all the programs this year. Delegate Young was asking for them um, in regards to a bill, and we had served the most in the state out of all the programs, which I think has a lot to do with our location, um, like you said. And we've been serving survivors of trafficking the longest out of any of the programs in the state. So I think that has something to do with it, too. Like, we've just done it longer but um, I think our location definitely contributes and to, just to backtrack to get everybody on the same page uh, epic is the Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center it used to be the Shenandoah Women's Center what were the changes that uh, you made as you changed from one name to the other Katie we updated the mission um, at the time so we changed the name and the mission in 2018 and at the time it didn't include human trafficking in our mission because that's a new sort of uh, route that we took in the late 2010s uh, so we wanted to make sure that was included, and then we changed the name all at the same time because, for multiple reasons. Number one, the agency had grown and evolved, being around 40 years at the time, um, and we serve more than women, and that's really hard when you have just women in your name. Um, and we were chronically confused for the gynecologist, so we were kind of done <laughs> being confused. Yeah, that was pretty constant. Um, I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> oh, every single day. And let me tell you, people start with the problem. So they'll call and just start telling you what their medical issue is, which is not <laughs> refreshing at all. No, um, I wouldn't think so. We had people so. show up for physical exams at our office before looking for the gynecologist. Well, you just needed a medical billing person, Katie, and you guys would have been fine. <laughs> That's what I said. I was like, we should just open up shop, make more money that way. No, oh, my goodness. we got three men in the room. The last thing we know about <laughs> is the gynecologist office. We have no idea what you're talking about there. Uh, we know a lot more about it than we should because yeah, well, we answered their phones uh, for under, years. Uh, understandable. Mr. Gilstrap. Uh, good morning, Katie. Uh, according to a uh, news site, mountainstatespotlight.org, it says that the um, the House, uh, in, in taking on the governor's West Virginia B Women's Bill of Rights bill, advanced it um, forward with the marital rape exception or exclusion as part of it. Is, is that... I heard the same thing. Okay. But it's... Um, yeah, and then it was pulled again yesterday from the... So I guess it was on third reading in the House. The Women's, uh, the women's Bill of Rights was, sorry. Um, and then was pulled. And I, I'm not... We're kind of lost on the why. I think it could have something to do with the language that was posted online wasn't the language that was passed in the second reading, the amended version. Um, so I'm wondering if it was just like a clerical thing that they're working out but um yeah it was supposed to move to the senate and we are we have some um issues with the women's bill of rights but we were going to talk with senator trump about that if it made it to the judiciary but just surrounding like who can access shelter but um it didn't uh make it to the house i don't know if it's on today i haven't looked does anyone know i haven't looked at it but no i don't know, I don't know it's interesting. It stood out because we had spoken about this before, and it, it. I thought, wow, here's here's a win. I didn't realize that they pulled it back. So sorry. It's yeah. Um, they pulled it off the house yesterday, um, but I they I, I think it could be because of that error online, like the wrong version was uploaded or whatever, which happens. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't know if that's it, but I guess we'll see. And just for clarity's sake, I, I think I know what it is, but go ahead and tell me what is sextortion. Sure. So it's essentially extortion where you're like um, holding something of value over someone and like forcing them to do something for something like money or something that they value. Um, but that same dynamic, except the act involves like sexual coercion. So 
for instance, the bill that we're running really focuses on people that are in positions of power over other. So think of like a teacher or a law enforcement officer or a judge or something who is like, if you don't do this sexual thing for me, I will fail you. I'll give you a failing grade or I'll pull you over every time you drive on the street or like whatever, using their position of power to force someone into sex acts, essentially, um, is the it's, it's clarifying the current definition of extortion to add that component. That's interesting. because It's. it's Different than what I thought it was going to be, actually. I thought it was going to be, here, you mm -hmm. sent me this picture, and I'm going to send it wide unless you, in, unless you send me money. Is that also... Oh, speaking of legislative um, wins, we already that one's already a crime from years ago. Um, Non-consensual non distribution of sexual images or intimate images or something. We called it um, revenge porn as a short a shortened uh. it when it was happening, but um, the longer name is something very long. But yeah, that is already a crime in West Virginia. And you mentioned, I, I didn't write it down fast, and I think I'm missing a word here, domestic violence review team. What is mm -hmm. that? Fatality review team. Fatality review yeah, team. So it's, yep, it's a team that currently lives in the ME's office, the medical examiner's office, that examines, so it's made up of the domestic violence coalition, domestic violence advocates, prosecutors, law enforcement, medical examiners, um, and they look at cases in which it was a confirmed domestic violence homicide, so they'll sort of back it up, like, okay, from the homicide, let's work backwards. Where did we fail this person? Like, why did this end in death? What, what you know, what uh, methods did they take to ask for help that maybe they didn't get help? Or did they know that they could get help? That kind of thing. Um, and they'll start to work backwards to figure out what caused the fatality to hopefully, you know, reduce future fatalities. And they'll also look at cases that could be. So think about, like, a case where maybe the person died of an overdose. But there was a documented history of the abuser forcing them to use substances or injecting them against their will. So they might look further at those cases saying, like, okay, maybe this could have been a domestic violence homicide, but it looks like an overdose. So they'll look at cases like that, too, where there's this intersection that could mean it was related to domestic violence, but not on the, not on face, like not on the surface. Um, and then they'll give, they'll use those cases to give like best practices. Like, okay, here's a trend we're seeing in domestic violence. Like when we passed the strangulation bill in 2015, we were seeing a lot of strangulation related either homicides or attempted homicides. So we were like, okay, this is a trend. We need, this is how we could help. Um, so they sort of trend forecast with it too, um, to help all service providers and law enforcement and prosecutors uh, better understand what's going on in the state and how we can keep people not only safe, but alive really. I'm going to guess an extraordinarily high percentage of homicides are domestic related, aren't they? Yeah, especially it's one of the leading causes of um, death among women in the state. Katie, I got a question. We've talked about some active legislation, some stuff you guys are pushing for, some stuff you want to see. What are some things, if you could just propose some bills, what are some things you'd like to see that would help women in the state of West Virginia? That's a great question, honestly. Thank you. Um, I, I try to make great yeah, questions. Yeah, I remember you know, it's a year ago. It's about time. time. You know, Rob, we're Rob taught me show. well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember who it was, but a years ago, God, like years ago, a, a um, candidate for governor came. Because oftentimes candidates will want to meet with us just to sort of see what's going on, you know, in our neck of the woods. And I don't even remember who it was, but he came. And I just remember one of his staffers saying, um, if you could change the like criminal justice system, rewrite it overnight, how would you do it? And I was like, oh, my God, I don't know. <laughs> um, but this feels a little less intimidating to answer. Um, number one, we, we have a lot of work to do still. Even though we passed a really good code in 2017 um, for human trafficking, we still have a lot of work to do. I don't, have you ever heard of Shared Hope International, that organization? No, what does it, what does it do? So it's a federal um, anti-trafficking organization. They focus really on children, but they've broadened their horizon to look at adult trafficking recently. And they do a legislative report card each year, and they rank each state's uh, human trafficking code, and then they give recommended solutions. So, like, if your state ranks low, here's what you could do to better your code section. Um, and ours is currently a D. So when we passed the law in 2017, we had an A. For a very short period of time but then of course as you know things change we fall behind so that's where a d there's a lot um so d needed a, a, a yeah we have a d on d doesn't mean card. darn we're doing well i know just means darn 
Um, <laughs> but uh, we need to clarify some stuff around child trafficking. There is a bill that uh, kind of piqued my interest. It didn't move. It hasn't moved since day one. It was introduced on day one in the Senate, um, and it was clarifying. I think the title was clarifying child sex trafficking but then when i read it it was like actually saying like right now in current code you can't prosecute a child for human trafficking so even if they're like 17 years old and they swear that they're engaging in sex work voluntarily you can't prosecute them for the person that was buying the sex would be charged with trafficking you can't actually have a child prostitute in west virginia this bill would have reversed that it would have said that you could charge a child so Shared Hope actually reached out to me and was like, do you know about this bill? And I said, yes. And they were like, well, that'll give you guys an F <laughs> if you pass it. And I was like, well, don't worry. It's not moving. So it doesn't appear to be gaining any traction. But it actually just made me laugh that they were like, you guys might have an F. Um, F for but, frankly, uh, we're, we're not doing well. Yeah, then, then we're really downhill. But, um, yeah, we need some clarity around that. They uh, Shared Hope likes it when you have some restorative justice stuff for – people who maybe were convicted of prostitution, but they were actually being trafficked. So above and beyond like an expungement um, and making the expungement process easier for those people would, would increase our score. Um, some standards of care. So some standards of how do you like domestic violence shelters, for instance, has a set, we have a set of legislative rules that tell us how we have to run our shelter and what we have to do, which actually is going through review this year. It's moving through the legislative session along with the law enforcement, 149, which is the domestic violence code for law enforcement officers. So both of those exist. A similar structure for human trafficking would help. Um, it would say, you know, what do standards of care have to look like for both responding to trafficking, but then also serving people who have been trafficked. Um, so that could really help. Um, there's a, a little push for that on a national level. So I think we'll see those coming down the pike in the next couple of years. Are you are you happy with the proposals for the, the new rules or the different ways they're gonna treat how you guys have to do what you do? Yeah, I don't I don't know that I fully understand it. Um, I've read the rule our rules that are moving through and there's moderate changes, um, so they're fine. They didn't really change anything in Title 149, which is the uh, law enforcement response, which again is fine. It was I, I didn't really have any issues with it as it was. So I think they're just doing the what every four years or six years they have to review the rules. We're in that stage where we just have to review the rules. Katie, before we end our segment, uh, I know there's also the there was at least one other thing I think you wanted to make sure you got out today as a message, correct? Did we cover yeah, everything? and Brittany, do you want to talk about the panel a little bit, and then I can jump in at the end with anything that I might have forgotten? Because you honestly sure. might know this better than me at this point. Absolutely. So on February 29th, we are hosting a domestic violence um, homicide reduction community panel forum, basically. So what we're going to do is we have a bunch of people. There's people from Epic. There are um, some law enforcement officers and a couple of other people. There's um, the prosecuting attorney from Berkeley County. I believe we're trying to get someone to represent magistrates and we're going to have people sit on it and we're going to discuss the fact that there have been multiple domestic violence homicides that have occurred in Berkeley County recently. And um, when those happened, a couple of people reached out to us and they were like, hey, can you guys address this problem? Is there something that we can be doing differently? How do we talk about this? How does this process even work? Because a lot of people don't really understand how the process of um, when there's a domestic violence homicide and the things that lead up to that and then what happens after the homicide occurs. So we're going to talk about those things. We're going to try to address some of the issues that every organization involved with what happens when a domestic violence homicide occurs can be doing to make things safer for the community, what we can all be doing better, and just try to have an open and honest discussion around that. Katie, did you have something yeah, to survivor, add to that? Um, one of the victims... Uh, the recent the spring mills homicide um, her family is coming so they're going to have some time to really talk with the public just about what um, they felt like would have helped what has helped since um, Bill Eilenfeld will be there the U.S. attorney to discuss his domestic violence homicide initiative that he launched in Martinsburg Berkeley County like a year ago um, so we're hoping to really look at it from all angles like federally state, locally, and then, like, how do we provide prevention and community support as well as a good response? Um, so sort of the whole problem in a nutshell. Very good. And if somebody would like to find out more about Epic or make a donation of some sort, how can they get in touch with you? Sure. Our
our website is epecwestwv, sorry, dot org. Um, our phone number, our business line is 304-263-8522. Um, you're welcome to reach out to us. You can reach out to the info at swcinc.org email for anything, too. And, yes, it's the old email because Google for nonprofits is a struggle. But <laughs> we're going to get it. We're going to get it changed one day. Um, so, yeah, reaching out, any of those. It is um, the event, by the way, the panel is February 29th at 6 p.m. at the Martinsburg Library, and it is open to the public. We do recommend that people be over probably 16 because there will be some difficult subject matter discussed. But obviously, you know, we will support whatever parents think are best. Katie and Brittany, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you for thank having you. us. You guys have a great snowy day. You too. Stay safe. Good luck with the power. Hope you get some heat. Yeah, yeah thanks. We're still, we're still here two hours in, but hopefully soon. Brittany, maybe you can send some of that heat Katie's way. She already was like, come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Stay off the roads right now. Hey, have a great day. <laughs> yeah, that's our plan. You too.